All right, people. Midweek report time. So, a lot to talk about. A lot of fights being rumoured. Um, a lot of news has come out over the last few days. So, a lot over the next 20 or so minutes to talk about. A lot to digest. Let's start with something that... It is boxing related, but... In a, you know, it, it, I'll explain it here, right? So, Bo Mack, right? Brian McIntyre, Bo Mack, the trainer of Terence Crawford, the trainer of Chris Eubank Jr., who found himself in a spot of butter, we'll use that word, post Eubank Jr. fight trying to go home to America. He um, had something that he really shouldn't have had and ended up not. It, 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 spot of butter, we'll use that word. I, I like that, a spot of butter. All right, we'll use that word first. So when I heard about that and heard, you know, basically what had happened, I was like, well, for one, how did he get it into the UK to start with? And then it turned out that he apparently had a private jet flying over and it was like, OK, it makes a bit more sense. But um, surely he would have known the, you know, the stuff that can happen if you're caught with that and it's not good. Right. And you're looking at about five years. Right. Bo Mack pleaded guilty. He got a 20-month suspended sentence. Uh, the judge waived the statutory five-year sentence due to uh, mitigating circumstances following a testimony from uh, character witnesses. All right, and one of them was Terence Crawford. Don't know what he did. Don't know what he said. But goddamn, he is a lucky, lucky, lucky man. He really is. Maybe he's a mason. <laughs> Joke. But seriously, he is a lucky guy to get a 20 month suspended sentence because more often than not they will they'll throw the book at you for that in the uk they take that stuff very very serious over there i don't even think it's as serious in ireland as it is in the uk i mean I, i'm not really as privy with it but like you know you hear stories all the time about people with that in ireland and you don't really hear of anything happened so you know bo mac lucky guy what's good for him well it's not really good in one sense but it probably means that he's unlikely i say unlikely you never know but unlikely to get back into the uk anytime soon which means that obviously chris eubank jr who he trains obviously eubank goes to the states to train with bomac that's no issue but coming over to the uk to train to you know finish training camp because you wouldn't do the whole training camp in the us and you know just arrive a couple of days before the fight it makes no sense with jet lag they normally tend to come around about a week to 10 days before the fight now, Eubank Jr. is in the UK and he's fighting in the UK. Bit of an issue getting Bo Mack over, you know. It's like that in other countries, you know. A good example would be Peter Fury when he was training Tyson for the uh, Stephen Cunningham fight. Stephen Cunningham fight. He couldn't travel over to the US because of previous convictions. It's likewise whenever Tyson fights in the US, his dad Peter, who is, or his dad Peter, his dad John, who isn't obviously his trainer, but he's a key member of Team Fury, he can't travel. He can't go to the US because obviously he has convictions as well. It's going to be difficult for Bomac to get in the UK. But the rumor mill is, is that Chris Eubank Jr. versus Conor Ben is already signed. Conor Ben is teased that he'll be back out in the month of December. And it's likely that that fight, if it is signed, because we're here and, you know, you never know what might happen. But it's likely that that fight is going to happen next. And it's being reported to take place in the Middle East. Now... I would imagine Bo Mack would have an easier time getting to the Middle East, getting in there anyway, than he would in the UK. So Eubank might be in, you know, it might be coming up green for him. It really would because if it's going to be at a full 160 against Conor Ben in the Middle East, he's likely to make a lot of money. I think he's going to win the fight. I think he's going to pretty comfortably beat Conor Ben. Certainly if it's at 160, no rehydration clause or anything like that, any nonsense like that in place then you're going to get a fully hydrated you well not a fully hydrated but as close to a fully hydrated you bank as you're going to get i'd say even now it's still a not ideal making 160 but he does it nonetheless whereas conor ben's never fought north of 147 well he has actually i tell you, like his last fight was north of 147 but primarily you know in terms of serious fights he's not campaigned north of 147 so uh, and look conor ben he has attributes there, but, and, you know, you saw improvement, but that improvement, people are questioning it, and, you know, good reason to, whereas Eubank, you know, the improvements have been there over Bomac. I mean, like, I've seen, in one fight, I've seen not just physical improvements, mental improvements with Eubank, in one fight with Bomac than he ever did with Roy Jones, and look, Roy Jones was a great fighter, but look, go ask any Chelsea fan, do you want Frank Lampard coaching Chelsea? Great player. 
Frank Lampard, although I was never a Chelsea fan, I always respected Frank Lampard because he was tremendous. I mean, he was just brilliant in his prime. But you wouldn't want him managing Chelsea if you're a Chelsea fan. You know, God knows who you'd want managing this because Chelsea at the minute, well, he's been playing a little bit better as of late, but still, you wouldn't want him managing you, nor would you particularly want someone like Steven Gerrard. You know, Wayne Rooney's gone from DC United, etc. I digress. You know, the Pep Guardiola's of the world, the Simeone's of the world were never the best. You know, they were never the, they were never on that level. And look at them, you know, Simeone. I mean, I wouldn't mind him at United, although I like to hack, but I wouldn't mind him at United. I really would. They wouldn't afford him. I, would I don't even think he... I, it, they would have not enough patience with his style of play there. It would take... You're looking at a good two years of rehabbing that team with, with Simeone. No football talk. I will digress from that. But yeah, Eubank versus Ben in the Middle East. Coming up... I don't know if that date, December the 23rd, for a variety of reasons will work. Primarily because, as I said, it's in the Middle East. Both guys are household names in the UK. You know, and... The fight is big in the UK. Obviously, I know the reason why they're talking about the Middle East, not just primarily because of money. I would imagine that would probably play a factor, but mainly to do with the fact that Conor Ben still has this UCAD appeal hanging over him. And again, why I just cannot comprehend why it's dragging out so long. You know, if you're going to appeal it, why is it going to take until December or January to get all this underway? You know, surely the appeal should have went in as soon as that National Anti-Doping Agency said we're provisionally lifting your suspension. Surely it should have been like, right, let's go balls to the wall and get it done. Why is it taking... Th I would imagine they're looking at legal avenues, as in, like, if we go down this road, uh, road are we privy to be sued? Because obviously the British Boxing Board of Control don't want that. They were they were, were nearly bankrupted by fish eyes many, many years ago. And that obviously is something that they don't want to happen. The British Boxing Board of Control can't afford it simple as they can't afford it so i would imagine they before they go and look to appeal it they're making sure their arses are covered simple as that's what i can imagine that's probably the only rational reason i can understand why it's taken so long to make sure that if we do this we are a-ok -okay, that we are not going to end up you know basically you know we'll sanction a fight for money for pay for food you know that sort of way that's what i would imagine they're going to do in terms of the fight itself we'll talk about it just as a fight Eubank Ben, again, I feel that Eubank could win. I think he'd probably stop Conor Ben, to be honest with you. I think that, you know, Conor Ben, his last fight was on, you know, reasonably short notice, although he was training out in the States, but he didn't look amazing. He was in there with a tough guy, to be fair. But I think that Eubank Jr., it shouldn't. I think that it's a shame we didn't have this Eubank Jr. four or five years ago, because this Eubank Jr. that I saw on Fight Night against Liam Smith, that, that he could have done something. You've got to have done something. It might be a bit too little, too late to do anything at world level, but you never know. You never know. In terms of some other news, in fact, actually, you know, and I know people are going to be saying, you know, Eubank versus Ben, that's a fight we don't want to happen for a variety of reasons. And I get that. I get that. But it's not the worst fight in terms of, well, everything, really. Morals, health, everything that I've seen announced. Because mark the date, Triller, do you remember them? We haven't heard of them in a long time. Well, they're coming back. They have a show planned in Kingston, Jamaica on September, or sorry, September, November the 11th, right? November the 11th in Kingston, Jamaica, okay? Um, now, now listen, right? This is, it's called Rumble in the Sun, right? Um, hmm, Rumble in the Sun. Razor Ruddock, do you remember him? Razor Ruddock, the Razor Ruddock who fought Mike Tyson, got knocked out in two rounds by Lennox Lewis. That Razor Ruddock, yeah, that's him. Guess who he's fighting? Guess who? Wait for it, wait for it. Yeah, James Lights Out Tony. James Lights Out Tony. Donovan Razor Ruddock in 2023 are having a professional boxing match. Also, there's a performance by the Beanie Man, whoever he is when he's at home. He's going to be there. Um, Woohoo. What the actual F? What the actual F is that? What, why are these two getting in the ring? Why is this being put on TV? I mean, Triller, it doesn't mention, but you can get it on Fight TV in the UK. Ooh, as if anyone's going to want that. Why in God's name? And who the hell is going to let James Tony anywhere near a boxing ring? I mean, I don't really know about Razor Ruddock's speech, to be honest with you. But he's he's got to be well in his 50s. Why the hell is, like, what the, James Tony can barely string a sentence together. What, what the hell is he doing? Why would anyone even think to have him anywhere near a boxing ring? For anything, you, you wouldn't even be able to commentate because he can barely string a sentence together. That is an absolute joke. That is a joke. Triller. 
you know, they came into boxing doing some of these little sideshow clown shows, but they were trying to do serious boxing as well. They hired, they signed people like Michael Hunter, who actually had a fight there over the weekend, believe it or not, Michael Hunter did. But then they just disappeared after that Kovalev-Pulev fight. That was the last show they put on. I think that was last year, if I'm not mistaken, May or April last year. And now they come back with this absolute filth. Jesus Christ. Absolutely ridiculous. Like, who the hell is going to want to watch that? Honestly, like, who the hell is going to want to watch that? In terms of fights that people may actually want to watch, Demetrius Andre will take on... Uh, he will actually take on Dave Benavidez for Benavidez's interim WBC Super Middleweight World title, November the 25th, Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas. Some people are already saying that they give Demetrius Andre a shot in that fight. I think, as I said before, 154, 160, Demetrius Andre's best weights. His best, the, the best I ever seen him was probably against uh, Willie Nelson. That was on, I think that might have even been on the undercard of Keith Term and Sean Porter. I think, don't quote me on that. But it was on a PBC show back in 2016. Best I ever seen Demetrius Andre. Looked a million bucks. Never seen him as good since then. That was at 154. I think his best days are well and truly gone. I'm not saying he's completely shot or anything like that. But I don't think at 168 he's going to have anything near the success that he did at the other two divisions. I don't think his power is going to try. I, I just don't see him having. And against someone like Benavidez who was massive at that weight. I just can't see him doing anything in that fight. I really can't. And it's a shame because I've always sung Demetrius Andre's praises for a long time on here. And some people would say, you know, you've kind of changed it a bit now. And I have because of a variety of things. I mean, this is a guy who wanted a Canelo fight. Fight Zach Parker. You get the Canelo fight. No, I'm not going to. I'm going to go and fight. What was the guy's name? I can't remember, but he fought him at a 10-rounder. I think it was on the undercard of Tank versus Hector Garcia, Hector Luis Garcia. And instead, you know rightfully or wrongly jack or john Ryder got the fight and you know he fought zach parker he beat him and he gets the canelo fight that could have easily so easily have been and, and i picked demetrius andre over john Ryder, by the way that could have so easily been him but no he he has to go down these roads and he's not going to make as much money i would imagine fighting benavidez and i think he's passed it now at this point anyway demetrius andre in terms of he's on the slide i think he's massively on the slide but on the slide nonetheless and you know here we are here we are. In terms of other fights that are... Well, this has been announced long before, but the ESPN US pay-per-view price, just so you know, of Tyson Fury, Francis Ngannou, which is coming up in a couple of weeks' time, is $79.99 in US dollars. So 80 US dollars for the privilege of watching Fury versus Ngannou. Now, I will admit, and I will attest to this, the undercard is absolutely stacked with heavyweight fights. It looks like a really really good undercard main event is just like what the hell is it you know we're already talking about fury Usyk being signed this is just a run out this is nothing it really is just a, a, a glorified exhibition whatever you want to call it i'm still unsure if it goes on their record but that's what it is 80 us dollars now crucially we know it's going to be on pay-per-view here we haven't got an announcement on how much it's going to be the rumor mill is and these are rumors right so don't quote me on it the rumour mill is £29.99, £30 in the UK. Now, some of you American fans would be saying, gee, $80, 30 UK pounds. Big difference. Yeah, big difference. But that is still a record price in the UK. Because UK pay-per-views primarily have been a lot, well, they're always a lot cheaper than the US. But primarily, they've never gone over. I mean, even for a UK pay-per-view to top 25 quid, a couple of years ago would have been seen as what? Now it's 30 quid potentially, potentially, but we don't have an official word or announcement on that yet. But 80 US dollars, damn, I mean, <laughs> that is, that's reaching. And then some, you know, what are the US fans going to think of it? Because I know a lot of people who watch my videos primarily are from the UK, but the, the second most subscribed country is America. So I wonder what you guys over there are thinking when you see Fury and Ganu. 80 us dollars will you pay for it i mean for me over here i could so easy like morally i'm not going to pay for it i'm not going to do it and that doesn't really benefit me but for, for moral purposes i'm not going to because i don't think i think it's just i don't right but i could do a watch along recoup the 30 quid make a profit on top of that and probably gain 100 subs from it morally i'm just not going to do it i'm just going to review a couple of the fights on it maybe do an aftermath live but 
I just I can't morally justify paying that. No way. No way. In terms of other heavyweight news, the IBF, now we, I done the video on this, I already spoke about it, and I already kind of, the IBF rankings, you do look at it and you're kind of like, what? Some of it makes sense, some of it doesn't. As I said, it's like the YouTube algorithms. You're never going to fully understand it. You're just going to look at it and think, huh? What the hell happened there? But if you start to wreck your brain on it, you'll just, you, you'll get nowhere. But apparently, you know, it's more so the kind of lower end because you're looking at fighters who are for, way further down. You're like, what's he doing there? And he's there. He just, yeah, you're going to go down that rabbit hole of just look at the rankings. You could be here a while. But number one and number two are now updated. So Hergovic retains his number one status. Of course, he's the mandatory challenger for the IBF title. He will then fight for the vacant title if the loser of Fury Usek ends up invoking the rematch clause, which they may do straight away or they may wait. You never know what they might do. Um, you know, to be honest with you, depending on how long they have for that rematch clause, there may come a situation where they say actually fight the IBF mandatory, get that done as quick as you can, and then we'll fight at the end of the, of the, the end of the year. So end of the calendar year, twenty twenty four. Because you never know. Say for say hypothetically, Usek beats Fury. Fury might look and say, do you know what? Right, I don't know if I can beat Usek a second time or if I have it in me to beat Usek. But if he fights Hergovic and that's more wear and tear on him, I'm not going to fight. I might just, you know, stay in the gym or something. You know, you never know. Some people might look at it like that. Uh, I doubt it'll happen like that. I'd say it'd be just an immediate rematch, in which case Hergovic would fight for the vacant title. Otto Valian, following on from his win over Morak Kassiev the other week, is now in at number two. He's been in salt number two in the rankings. So that would mean we would get Hergovic versus Otto Valian. That really is not a, a compelling fight when you think about it from a viewer's perspective. I could see that fight, you know, putting an insomniac to sleep if we get the Philip Hergovic we've got over the last couple of fights. But I would be picking Hergovic to win that fight and it would be for the title. And we have that. So Tommy Fury has shown a video or picture, I should say, of his transformation, body transformation, start a camp over the last nine weeks. Good Lord, he is looking shredded. I'd say Vada are looking, thinking, I wish we were doing testing for this fight because we would have a field day, as would Sal P. And yes, I'm talking about YouTube boxing. He's looking in good shape, to be fair. He looked an absolute blob in the pick I'm seeing here. He looks in good nick, actually, in this one. Apparently, he's lost 66 pounds. It's a fair play to him. But yeah, we have obviously... We obviously, I'm going to talk briefly about it, right? KSI, Tommy Fury, this coming weekend. The Misfit Show, it's on the zone. No, we're not doing a watch along. And no, I'll be watching it by other means. That's only the fight on the card that I'm interested in. The only kind of real YouTuber fights, and I don't really count Jake Paul versus Fury as a YouTuber fight because it was done under Queensbury rules. It was going on their record. I mean, Jake Paul has an L because of it. So you can kind of... Yes, you could probably argue there was an element of the YouTuber aspect in it, but at the undercard was full of real fights. Whereas this is all YouTubers. The only YouTube fight I've ever been keen on really watching, um, for comedy purposes, you know, because I can see the fun side of this and I could see the car crash element of it. Never really came, but we still got a, a knockout, which was Rings of Redemption versus Boogie 2988. For a purely theatrical comedy point of view, that just intrigued me i don't know why that just intrigued me you have two grotesquely overweight for well they're still youtubers but you know the dead channels and yeah they were going at it and that was hilarious to me so i watched i didn't do a review on it but i did watch it you know you have wings of redemption look here smashing controllers and you have boogie 2988 with the francis francis character yeah i i, I was all for watching that Watched it by other means, but I watched it nevertheless. Um, John Fury, by the way, he is in his element at these events. He is absolutely in his absolute element. He is starting rows with absolutely everybody. He's throwing things at KS. He is just in his element. He's in his element because he's around, let's be frank, right? He's around these YouTubers who, realistically, many of them, you know, they're going in the ring and, you know, they're having... A fight as such but like realistically you know are these the kind are these going to be guys you're going to look at and go better not cross him not really 
John Fury would not be as... He is animated at the boxing events, he is. But would he be as animated, you know, if there was a lot of Dean Whites around and stuff like that? You know, no, he wouldn't. You know, if, if there was a lot of baby things around there, I don't think he'd be quite as, you know... He might do it with security around, but that's the kind of guy John Fury is. He'd really happily square with the baby thing, but security are going to pull you away instantly. You know, that's him. But he was having to say on actual boxing when he was asked on thoughts on Fury versus Usek being signed. And he said, and I quote here, he, Alexander Usek, is lucky to get a shot after what happened with Daniel Dubois. Because Dubois should be the champion. Usek doesn't pose a threat to Tyson, but the Saudis want it. They paid for the fight, so it's happening. Doesn't pose a threat to Tyson. Right. So all the moving the goalposts earlier in the year. You know, if, if he doesn't pose a threat, why did Tyson Fury say he needed a tune-up in 2022 when the negotiations were going on? Because to imply you need a tune-up fight before fighting someone who's essentially a little middleweight and who shouldn't, you know, pose a any threat, that doesn't quite jive. And that did happen in early 2022 where Joshua was toying with the idea of step-aside money. There was talk of Fury Usek. He said he needed the tune-up fight, which was Dylan White. Why would you need a tune-up fight for a middleweight who, you know, according to your father there, poses no real threat, answers on a postcard? We know, obviously. We know that this is... Tyson Fury, Team Fury see this as a serious fight. You know, they do. I remember Peter Fury in interviews was saying, you know, it is a serious fight. You know, he's obviously back in Tyson, and you would expect, look, I'm back in Tyson as well. But Peter Fury knows this is a serious fight, and it is a serious fight. And look, whatever happens, you know, obviously we know what's going to happen on the, the October 28th. You know, Francis Ngannou, he ain't got no chance. He ain't got no chance. But all I'm hoping is that we just get the date announced and then we can really start, you know, because I, I believe this fight is going to happen. You know, I know you could say, gee, you've fallen for it a few times. And I have, you know, I really thought it would happen earlier in the year. But I do believe it's going to happen. Call me crazy. I do believe it's going to happen. And, you know, once we get the date, that's going to be, that's going to be a good thing. David Hay has predicted that KSI will upset Tommy Fury on Saturday night. So Tommy Fury is going to win. Put a bit of money on that. David Hay has picked KSI. We always know. David Hay is involved, you know, so money on Tommy Fury ASAP. David Hay has picked him. I think that's pretty much a foregone conclusion. He's going to win. So there you go. I think Tommy Fury is going to win, though. I'd be very, very, very surprised if KSI beats Tommy Fury in any way, whether it's by point stoppage or anything. I'd be very surprised, very surprised. Now, let's look at some of the fights that are up and coming or being talked about in the pipeline. Shout out to International Boxing News. They're always very good with getting the news out with regards to fights that are in the pipeline. And I'm really intrigued with this fight right here. Lee McGregor, who obviously lost his last fight, and he hadn't looked himself over the last year or so since he had that draw in Bolton at the start of last year. And then obviously he lost his last fight. The rumor mill is that on the 1st of December, which is a Friday, I believe, in Blackpool, which is strange, it's not a place you'd associate really with boxing, is that he is going to be taking on Isaac Lowe. And that'll be on Channel 5. That's a good domestic fight on Channel 5. No one can really complain about that. Isaac Lowe, obviously the man who, you know, would make you believe spell check doesn't even work. If you've ever seen some of the tweets he uses, clearly he maybe doesn't have spell check on. Or maybe maybe he doesn't maybe he thinks that his spelling is right and spell check is irrelevant. That's what it's there for. So you don't make yourself look a you know what, which he does consistently with spell checks but nevertheless him against lee mcgregor is a decent fight i rate lee mcgregor i think that he has looked a shell of himself in reality over the last couple of fights i don't know what's been wrong with him whether there's been some weight issues personal issues i don't know but all i know is that he is a better fighter than those two performances would have you believe in terms of some other fights that have been announced um or rumored gullamarian the champion uh the wba champion at cruiserweight it's rumoured that he has a deal reached to face Yoniel Dorticos on November the 10th, which again is a very, very interesting, intriguing fight. It's not a bad fight at all. Um, Yoniel Dorticos is a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous man at cruiserweight. Very flipping dangerous. That man at cruiserweight is, I would say, do you know what I want to call Yoniel Dorticos? He is the first of the new age of Cuban fighters. That's the best way I would describe him. Because... Cuban fighters before Yoniel Dorticos, safety first, don't read. They, they, they let their boxing do all the talking. 
You only have Dorothy Coast, the KO doctor, and he is the KO doctor because he goes in looking for the KO like that. And he is a he's a massive puncher, a cruiser, a massive puncher. He has kind of started the trend because we're seeing it now with some Cuban fighters who come, they're a lot more aggressive. You know, Frank Sanchez being the exception. But a lot of them would be a lot more aggressive now than they used to be. And I want to say he is the start of the I call it the new age, the new ager of Cuban fighters, where they are their boxing is still there. And they can still box. You know, the articles can box a bit as well. But they go in and they're looking for the jugular. You know, they are actually a lot more exciting than they used to be. You know, and maybe you could say Ortiz was the guy who really started it. Because Ortiz, you know, the only fights he's had that have been stinkers have been when the opponent has really just turned up to survive. You know, the, Ma- the Malik Scott and the um, I thought he had against Christian Hammer, who always does that. But if you look at some of his performances, like the Brian Jennings, you know, electric. You know, not Brian Jennings, and, and a lot of respect, a massive, heaps of respect for Brian Jennings, you know, as a man. But, you know, he was never a top-tier heavyweight. He was always just, he was world-ish level on his day, but just about that, you know. But Ortiz, you know, throwing shots from the get-go. So, yeah, it'd be interesting to see that fight. It's a very good fight in itself. I think that's pretty much it. So, we got most of the kind of rumor mill on fights. We talked about everything that's been in the news over the last couple of days. So, I will leave it there. I hope you enjoyed the video, people. I don't know if I'll have anything, unless anything comes up tomorrow. I don't want there to be any videos going out on Friday. I might do a post-fight to KSI Tommy Fury. And hopefully, if all goes according to plan, we'll do a little Sunday sesh. How about that? We haven't done a Sunday session in a while. We normally do them after a fight, but we'll probably try and do... A Sunday sesh regardless this coming weekend. So I'll leave it there. Hope you enjoy the people. Smash the like button if you could. Hit subscribe of course if you haven't already. As always I appreciate the support. It's been amazing. More support the better. Smash the like button. Share the vids because that really does help. It massively helps as well. Comment all that good stuff. We get the numbers up. They've been growing and growing and growing and growing. It's been lovely to see. I've been so thankful for it. I appreciate it all. Thank you everybody. I will talk to you. Peace.